Hello and welcome to Season 4, Episode 16 of the Sajan Photography Podcast. My name is Jason Teal and we're back here with another wonderful interview. This time I am sitting down and talking with my good friend Lee MacArthur. And Lee and I go back many, many years, but in this interview you get to see sort of the depth of his character and how many layers he has, not necessarily like an onion, but maybe he'll make you cry to reference an old Shrek movie. But Lee is a remarkable character and he's got a lot of great stories and a lot of experience, especially dealing with media and different government organizations in the realm of photography here in Korea. So sit back, grab some coffee, grab your popcorn, grab yourself. I don't know, but let's jump into this great interview and let's get it on. All right, Lee, welcome to the show. It's It's been a while and I'm glad to have you on here. But before we get uh, too far into the questions, uh, why don't you just take a moment to introduce yourself to the many two fans that I have that might not know who you are. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jason. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's awesome to be here. Uh, it's great to see you again uh, and talk to you again, of course. Uh, it has been has been a day or two, I guess. Yeah. I think the yeah, last time we saw I think the last time we saw each other face to face was at the uh, National Geographic uh, exhibition at Seoul City Hall. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Then that was quite some time ago. Yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing how time flies. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, name's Lee MacArthur. Uh, born in a uh, small town, not so small anymore, but uh, called Bowmanville, Ontario. It's about a hundred kilometers east of Toronto. Uh, and I uh, first got to Korea the summer of 2003 and uh, spent many a year in Korea exploring the country. Uh, let's see, I spent the first four years in Seoul and uh, decided, you know what, Seoul's a great city, lots to do, 24 hours a day, but, you know, Health's a pretty important thing, too, so I needed to get out for there's a little more cleaner air and uh, moved out to Kawangdo for eight years on the East Coast and uh, sp spent uh, most of my time out there. Absolutely loved it. Uh, wasn't uh, overly happy having to move away from there, uh, but uh, the economics of, of the time... Uh, Forced me back to the greater Seoul area for my final four, four and a half years before I uh, moved back to Canada. Um, won't get into the, the reasons for that. Uh, it was uh, a family thing that needed to be taken care of. Uh, but uh, moved back to uh, Nova Scotia, which for the geographically uh, challenged people out there is actually on the east coast of Canada. So I went from one east coast to the other east coast and uh, almost literally exactly halfway around the world and uh, loving it okay. so far. Well, there you go. We all have our story. Uh, like, I think there's two prequel sort of stories that we all have. It's usually the how you got into photography and how you got to Korea. But I want to kind of change things up. And this is sort of maybe a chicken or the egg kind of question. But what came first? Was it? Photography or Korea, which came uh, first? Definitely photography. I I actually remember having my very first camera when I was probably about six or seven years old. Uh, yeah, it was one of the little uh, those little one twenty format film cameras, like the little yep. rectangles. It was yep. gold. I can't remember the name of it. I every every once in a while I'll Google it just to look at it again. Uh, but you would actually push it in and pull it back out to wind it uh and I actually still have two photographs in my photo album of my friends in oh, my wow. yard at home from that camera i remember my my grandfather on my dad's side he had this little spy camera tucked away in a drawer at his house and every time i'd go and visit i'd always pull it out and play with it and look at it and just in awe on how tiny this little this little spy camera was and but after that you know it was you know all through school never really picked it up never did much with it 
got to high school, no time for it. You know, all the sports, baseball, basketball, volleyball, badminton, and then senior concert band, jazz band, and all that while trying to maintain an A average and all that type of fun stuff you do in high school. But I had one friend who pretty much slept with his camera. And he was obviously the uh, the yearbook photographer. And uh, there was one photo that he had taken of me during one of my one of our baseball games. And it would to this day is probably one of the best photographs I feel of me. And oh, wow. uh, always, and I thanked him for it. And uh, yeah, he's he's actually he was staff photographer actually for the the newspaper in Brandon for the longest oh, really? time. Yeah, yeah, working he for moved, the Brandon Sun. Yeah, Brandon Sun. Uh, his name was Bruce Bumstead. Uh, I think during the uh, when they were downsizing, I think they let him go, unfortunately. But yeah, it was and it was really wild because I always looked up to him because he was such a great photographer. And uh, and I told him that he answered back. He said that's wild because he he you know, he said he he looked up to to my photography at that time. Like this was back like oh, wow. mid mid Korea years now. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, he he was always looking at my stuff and was very felt very inspirational after looking at my stuff and that to me was one of the biggest compliments i'd ever gotten and so yeah oh, no wow. definitely photography was first for me um it was during university actually that i got right right into it um i went over i was lucky enough to be able to spend a term over in uh, france uh, going to university in france and uh, of course uh when you go to Europe, you got to take a camera with you and uh, document your time. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So uh, I took my dad's old uh, Konica, loads of uh, film, and uh, he gave me a quick rundown. Dad was always quite the photographer, too, always had cameras around the house. And so he showed me how to use the polarizing filter and, you know, essentially said, okay, I've set the settings here didn't really think much of it at the time you know it's just like okay he said just don't touch any of the dials i've set it all up all you gotta do is is hit click and in focus right because it's all manual yeah. focus back then yeah got over there it was taking pictures and i found a, a lab over there to to develop and so i started developing some of the photos and yeah it was very nice photos and then every once in a while there's like after our trip to Florence, we had a school trip, you know, yeah, we had a school trip to Florence, Italy, you know, and, and, nice. uh, there's, uh, there's a couple of shots here. I'm like, wow, those are really cool. And, uh, you know, again, didn't think much of it. And then, uh, after the term was done, I flew up to Paris for a week or so and, you know, because I love Paris. I've been to Paris a couple of times. One of my favorite cities in the world. Oh, huh? uh, my fo- my photos in Barcelona didn't turn out so well. But anyway, Barcelona is an awesome city, too. Shout outs to Barcelona. But yeah, Paris was always one of my favorite cities. And, uh, and I got a couple of really great shots of the Eiffel Tower and, and whatnot. And I'm just looking at those pictures of Paris and the ones that I got in Florence. And it was like, wow, how did I do that? And how can I do it again on purpose? And uh, that led me going to the bookstore and picking up the National Geographic Field Guide on Photography. And That's a good and, one. And uh, just started reading and reading and reading. And every internet still in its infancy there. And uh, when I got to Korea, the, the first major purchase I bought was, uh, an, it was, a, was a film camera. It was, 2000, it was December 2003, so a couple of months after I got there. I didn't, because uh, digital was still really expensive at that time. We'll stick with film, that's what I know, and I just don't have the money for a $1,000, $1,000, you know, plus yeah. digital camera. <laughs> I remember my my friend and I were talking about it, and he said, you know, if digital cameras ever got to under $1,000, I might be able to, I might think about buying one. You know, film camera taking pictures of, of soul and, and whatnot. And then 
you know, working at the the hog one, you you go out and you're taking pictures of the the school trips, and you get them of developed. Course. You you give them to the school, and they're like, oh wow, those are really good. And then next thing you know, I'm having to go out on every school trip just to take pictures. <laughs> You, you become the uh, the, the sponsored official. photographer, yeah, official photographer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it just you kept. I just kept reading and learning and uh, taking pictures. And what year was it? Uh, two thousand five. Yeah, it was two thousand five. I went back home, so it was two years. Went back home for a visit, and that's when I had the conversation with my friend about the under thousand dollar camera. Three months after I got back to Korea, I saw that the Nikon D fifty, the six megapixel. Oh, yeah. 50 was was under a thousand dollars it was like six hundred dollars i'm like you know what it's time and i didn't really just jumped into it didn't do a whole lot of research i got the nikon because i had a nikon film camera and i knew that the lenses would fit into the the digital body too uh so i wouldn't have to buy new lenses and uh then yeah then the big shocker and thing i hadn't thought of was like oh you need a memory card too oh <laughs> right Okay, yeah. So, so he's the guy at the shop sells me a the largest memory card they had at the time, which was yep. two hundred and fifty six megabytes. Not even a, you know, wasn't very big, and it yep. was like eighty dollars or something. They don't, you know, you, now you can get like a terabyte hard drive for that much. <laughs> it's it's well, crazy. It's it's funny that you bring that up because I remember I came to Korea in July of two thousand three. Twenty two, two thousand three. Wow, that's <laughs> insane. And so, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I noticed was uh, I, I had the same revelation, and actually, my entrance into digital photography was probably about the same time you picked up your Nikon and. I was sitting in a cafe and I said to my friend who was also a photographer at the time, I said, you know what? Like, I don't want the cool pics clicky thing. I, I, if they had a like digital SLR, I would like buy one if it was not like the crazy expensive one. He's like, oh, you mean like that digital rebel? And I like look and like, damn it. And then like we went probably the following weekend and picked up like the 300D Canon that up. And same thing. It was like 256 megabytes. And when the 512 came out, we're like, oh, man, like this is this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, $200 memory card. <laughs> yeah, like now I'm looking at like the average memory card that I pick up now is uh, 128 gigs. <laughs> you know, like Yeah, and if you're spending more than $30, you're kicking yourself for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's actually, you know, getting into sort of like, the the Korean side and back then, like you had a good build up there. Like you 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 snapped some shots in, in Europe and whatever, and obviously you had your foot into like photography when you came into Korea. But um, you've done a lot during that time here in Korea. Can can you take us through like sort of the the high points of your your photographic career? Like how did it start? What did you get into and and all that kind of fun stuff? Because I think like for the people that I've I've talked to over the years, like you were one of the people who, you know, got into some amazing places, TV, the Olympics somehow, and you know, stuff like that. Somehow. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> how did it happen? Timing. Okay. It's all timing timing and uh and luck and in skip well. I don't want to say, you know, skill, but, but you know, a I'd lot of it so. has to do that too. It's, uh, it's a combination of the three. You know, photographers, we always like to say, you know, you make your own luck. And, and I am a believer of that. Uh, but there is also an element of, of just random chance luck. Let's see here. I think the first part of it was um, back when I – started getting a, a fair bit of smoke blowing up my butt. That's when I started getting the confidence because I'm a really shy and, you know, my wife's always complaining that I don't have enough confidence. Uh, you know, even the owners at my hog one at the time were saying, Oh, you got to have an exhibition. You got to have an exhibition. I'm, I was like, oh, I never, you know, I always say I'm never that good. I'm just not that good. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. You know? And 
part of that's a good thing to have too, because you're always striving to be better, you're learning and, and that type of thing. But uh, yeah, so when I got the confidence, I started entering competition, you know, the photo contests and I'd upload and enter into things. And Korea's got tons and tons of photo competitions all around the country. Oh, yeah. So th- there's actually a couple of websites that will list them. I can't remember what they are now because I haven't done it for quite some time. But uh, I remember one of the first ones was there was a an insect expo. And oh, yeah. I think it's in, it was near Yangju. I can't remember exactly where it was, but I'm like, okay, we're going there. And I'm going to take pictures and enter this contest because that that was that was my fun for the weekend after the hog one is like go around the country and go to these expos and enter their contests and see what I can do. And I think with that one, uh, I ended up getting third place for that one. Oh, wow. Uh, Soul's got a whole bunch of uh, contests going on. I entered one of those contests. All the entries were going up on their website and uh, it was you know, I'm looking at all these pictures. I'm going, man, these, a lot of these entries really aren't that great. You know, it's <laughs> no offense to the people taking them, but you know, a lot of them were just snapshots they had done with their, their one megapixel phone or whatnot, you know, which at the time was, was wonderful, you know, to be able to take a picture with your phone at that time. That was, you know, all, I had a camera on my phone at that time too. And all my, all the teachers were like, Oh, wow. You got, wow. The best phone on the market. Where did you get that? I'm like, well, anyway, I <laughs> the LG flip phone. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was a Samsung actually. Ooh, uh, but the camera, was in, the camera was in the the hinge, and you could actually rotate it for your selfie, or you could move it around to the front and take it forward. I remember yeah. that one. Yeah, it sticks on and had a little screen on the front oh, and lit. Oh, it was a beautiful phone. I loved it. Uh, again, digress. <laughs> but yeah, so I entered this contest and um, I started looking. I'm going, man, I there's a chance I might be able to win, right? I I don't see a lot of photos here that are that much better than mine. So one day I enter the contest, and during the judging time, I actually that was the time I actually moved out to Samchuk in Kalangdo. Uh-huh. And um, so I get a phone call from Seoul City Hall and he speaks no English. So I had to give the phone to my wife. And uh, so she talked to him and uh, he just absolutely was in love with my photo. And he loved it so much. And he was on the board of tourism for Seoul and was in charge of this contest. And he invited me and my wife to Seoul for lunch to talk about this contest. Oh, nice. And I'm like, all right, sure. Why not? Any excuse to get back to Seoul. So we went in and uh, met him for lunch. So he said, okay, so here's the situation. Uh, We weren't expecting any foreigners to enter, although the rules don't state that no foreigners weren't allowed to enter. And the other thing is uh, you don't live in Seoul anymore. And it was open for Seoul residents. <laughs> he says, but we really, really love this photo. So here's the deal. We want to give you third place. You would actually, I, you know, you should win this contest, but we can't do it because we're, we're a, a little afraid of the, the backlash of being a foreigner and not actually living in Seoul. We'll give you third place, but this is what we want to do. We want to make you an official photographer for the city of Seoul. Damn. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> He's like, okay, so this is what we'll do. You know, you'll get your prize money for third place. And then as official photographer for Seoul, we'll pay you uh, so much money for every upload you make onto our website. And I'm like, all right. Awesome. And uh, yeah, so he said, and that's going to make you the very first ever foreign born official photographer for the city of Seoul. And I'm like, wow, you know, like they're just small town Canada kid getting an honor like that, you know, like this city is thousands of years old. Wow. Like I couldn't believe it. And uh, first big, big break there, really. 
That's and a massive big break. <laughs> just for entering the contest. And uh, I wonder what the kid that I took the picture of is doing now. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like it, it, it's one of these things that what I love about sort of, especially that era, because I, I, I do think it's changed. Mm. But um, I can, I can tell from the story and, I, and I've lived a similar experience, but like that era was such a magical time because of situations like that, where you enter a contest and then someone sees it and there was that energy and enthusiasm. It blew my mind when you said you, you're the first official photographer, you know, for the city of Seoul, it's like, you know, Toronto, Tokyo, you know, Seoul, these are major cities. Oh, yeah. And and you're that guy, you know, as as it's shifted into sort of the K-pop Instagram era that that's sort of, you know, as you said, it's the timing because you just had that perfect timing. Yeah. And then you did that and it's paying too. So oh, yeah. they what happened after that? Like cuz I'm I'm sure you you went on to to do bigger and better things. Well, actually, uh, not really. Not from that. Uh, okay. I, it did well for me. And uh, even, you know, it was a one-year contract. And then when that contract uh, finished, they asked if I wanted to sign another. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> of <course. laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. They paid me to take pictures. Yeah, I'll sign. And they gave me a huge raise for that, too. And Oh, nice. Uh, oh, yeah. Like, it was it was beautiful. And then uh, signed a third contract. At the end of the third contract, the money started disappearing. They didn't. It wasn't yeah. in the budget. Different mayor and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And although I'll tell you though, too, getting a personalized uh, Christmas card from the mayor of Seoul every year too was kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Who has that? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no. And then uh, so then you know because I was in in Samchuk, I didn't have my own car. I was having to bus it in to Seoul for the weekends to do these projects and. Uh, the money they were offering for the fourth contract uh, wouldn't cover my expenses, so I, d I declined the fourth. The fourth contract entered the next phase, uh, which is when I was just back in Seoul, uh, randomly taking pictures. My wife had stayed home, and uh, in Samchuk, so I was there by myself, and I was just wandering around the city with my tripod and my camera and taking pictures as I normally would. And I was walking around just that street between Insadong and uh, Bukhan. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, like the the Mao. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it was east of uh, Kangbokgung. Yeah, but yeah, not I know. Quite Duxigung, or not? Uh, not Duxigung. Chung. Uh, Chung Dukgo. Yeah, that's or... it. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah, near the prosecutor's office. I noticed these three girls following me. You know, they're all wearing match the matching jackets and whatnot, and they had papers and a clipboard with them. And they're following me and following me, and I'm like, okay. But I was actually on the phone talking to my wife at the time, explaining what I was doing and whatnot, and just talking, seeing how she was doing and whatnot. And I was standing, so I just stopped, and I was just standing and talking to her. I had nestled myself into a corner at the gate at the prosecutor's office to to block the wind because it was in the middle of winter. And uh, these girls just stood there and waited and waited and waited. I'm like, man, what do these <laughs> girls want? You know, they just, they want to, you know, they obviously wanted to talk to me for something. And, uh, but, I, you know, I'm not going to hang up on my wife just to see what they want. So. I guess finally uh, I was just taking too long on the phone. Like I was, it was like a 20, 30 minute con phone conversation and I finally gave up and started to walk away. I hung up maybe about two or three minutes later. And my, these girls spent so much time following me and waiting. Let's chase them down and see what they wanted. Yeah. So I, I walked the way they went and, uh, Saw them down the end of the street, so I didn't race by any means. I, you know, if I'm not playing baseball, I'm not running. <laughs> you know, doesn't matter. Even if a bear's chasing me, anyway. That again, I digress. So I, I caught up with the girls, and uh, I'm like, hey, you know, I, I saw you were waiting for me. Uh, what, what would you like? You know, did you want to talk about something? Did you need to ask me something? 
and they introduced themselves. Uh, they were with a thing called uh, Visit Korea 20, uh, whatever year it was. I have a good memory, but it's short. So what they were doing was they were going around asking foreigners uh, questions about Seoul and Korea, what they liked about it, that type of thing. And then they would take yeah. a picture uh, with with the, the person. And uh, for their little tour, Korea tourism project that they were doing. Mm-hmm. So I answered the questions and the one girl pulled out this little point and shoot camera and was like, okay. I said, no, 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 no. No, this is a horrible <laughs> spot for the picture. Let's go over to the uh, Buddhist temple there, where there's uh, the very first post office. The Korean post office was right there, too. I yeah, can't right. remember the name of that one. Yeah. No, it's right in the front gate there. So the sun was, it was just getting in the golden hour, too. So I'm like, okay, tell you what. I got the camera and I got the tripod here. I'll set it up. We'll take the picture and I'll, I'll send it to you. So that's what I did. She even sent me a picture of me getting the camera ready. I got my, what was it? I got my lens cap in my mouth and I'm pulling the legs out of my tripod. <laughs> it was a rather flattering photo. But anyway, I uh, so I got the picture. I sent it to them. They sent me an email back, you know, thanking me for the photo, saying it was by far the best photo that they had of this whole project. and. And uh, and that was it. You know, they gave me a little goodie bag, you know, with the uh, Visit Korea, you know, notepad and a couple of the the, the cartoon of the, the month, you know, the that little toy air talking airplane, you know, yep. that type of stuff. And, and that was it. It was fast forward like two years. It was 2011. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the girls, just out, one of those three girls out of the blue sent me a uh, an email saying, would you be willing to write a story? You know, I know you're a photographer and you've been around Korea quite a bit. Would you be willing to write a story for Jung An Ilbo about your experience? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? Cool. And they were going to pay me for it. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Anything, you know, (laughs) anything almost for money. Um, So, (laughs) I wrote the article, you know, and I was trying to think, okay, what can I write about? You know, there, there are so many places around Korea that are photogenic. You know, it's just Korea is such a, a great country for photographers. Uh, yeah, I can't express that enough. So I ended up just writing about where I was living in Semchuk because to me it was such a great little spot because essentially where I was living and I imagine you're, I don't know the Ulsan geography that well, but uh, it's it's similar. I think you got a little further travel to get to the mountains, but in Semchuk, it's it was literally ten minutes to my left was the ocean, ten minutes to my right were the mountains, and you know, it's, okay, what do I want to do today? Mountains or ocean? <laughs> exactly. And there were an abnormal for me anyway, an abnormal number of rainbows that would happen in Semchuk. You know. Oh, really playing baseball and you know hey wow look at the rainbow my guy's like oh yeah they happen all the time <laughs> so i uh, i i wrote the paper i sent it to them uh it got uh, translated into korean and it made it into uh jung on ilbo uh on october 30th and that day i started getting phone calls and emails and i was like like I was getting phone calls from Vancouver, like all around the world and saying what, you know, what a great, what a great article that was, you know, would you be able to, you want know, you want to a- a- answer a few questions here and there? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? And, and then I got an email from a production company saying, uh, would you, would you be interested in doing a TV show? And I'm like, what? No, this can't, this can't be real. No, nobody in their right mind would put me on TV. So I said, you know, yeah, that would be cool. I've got no experience in front of a camera. Ah, don't worry about it. It's okay. So I'm like, okay, sure. Why not? So we were negotiating that. And then I think the next day I got another email. That production company was doing a TV show for Adidang. So of course, I'm, you know, I let my wife into all of this too. And then I got another email the next day f- and uh, this one was from EBS. I'm like, what? Hold, what? Hold on here. What about this was Adidang? 
And they're like, oh, no, we want to do something else. We want to do a documentary. What? <laughs> I mean, oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Why not? Then what was it? It was like a that afternoon or maybe, maybe the next day after that, I got a third email. Yeah, we're a production company. We're doing a TV show for SBS. Uh, we'd love to have you on. Um, what? <laughs> like because of this article, right? And you hit the big time. <laughs> yeah, and it was it was it was crazy because it just all happened just like bam. And it was all because of this article that I wrote where I got the chance because of a random meeting in Seoul from like two years ago. That's and crazy. It, was just, it, it absolutely was. And you know the the <laughs> the funny thing, one of these phone calls I got. Because at the bottom of the article was uh, my photo. They oh. wanted me. They wanted me. They wanted me to submit a photo, and it was a pretty nice photo. I don't. I don't. Pho- I don't photograph very well, but it was a pretty nice photo I had taken of myself. So <laughs> one of the phone calls is, is, I answered the phone, and it was a woman, and she just started speaking Korean, and. I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Because I thought maybe it's, you know, another news outlet or, you know, TV or newspaper or something. And so I, I went to give the phone to my wife to, to talk to her. And yeah. I guess during the, the the exchange to my wife, I accidentally hung up. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so I called the number right back. So my wife put it on speaker and... Uh, she answered the phone and my wife, you know, in Korean says, hi, this is Lee MacArthur's wife. Uh, we're just calling you back. Click hung up. <laughs> like, I think this woman just saw my picture and maybe assumed I was single, was seeing, was assuming I was single. <laughs> I called back. And she just answered, she just hung up. And I was like, wow. Is that like my first stalker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, she she's following the articles, watching it on TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that yeah, that was that was a funny little thing that happened there, and uh, yeah. So then the Artie Dung thing happened, and uh, it was um, I did it over the course of of the next three weekends. The craziest, and this is all. This was at the end of this was in the end of November, beginning of December of two thousand eleven. After I finished up with, with Artie Dong, uh, the next Friday, that following Friday, was to be the documentary with EBS. Okay. That was about something that you and I are both familiar with, and they want, you know, the, the sunrise, you know, on the East Coast. and Of course, yeah. That, that, was, uh, that was an early morning. I uh, woke up at 3.30 for that. And oh, it wow. was bitterly, bitterly cold that morning. It was like, my, you know, and it doesn't get that cold that often, but this morning it was like minus 20 Celsius oh, for, Celsius for the, for the American folk right there. So I decided not to wear my glasses. I put in my contact lenses because I didn't want my glasses fogging up or freezing during filming. So the, the schedule that day was wake up at three thirty, out the door by four thirty which is where I met the crew in my parking lot at my building. I had a camera guy in my car as we drove down to uh, Zhang Ho Port. And so we filmed this documentary uh, in the morning. No, I'd actually met them earlier in the week at a cafe and go over all the details and whatnot. And they asked me where I was wanting to shoot. So we got that all hammered out first, of course. So we finished up probably about 1130-ish. We all had lunch together. Then it was back in the car, back to the hog one teach from when did i have to be at the school uh it's probably about one o'clock or so so yeah it was a quick lunch 20 minute drive back school one o'clock finish at eight and hop on the bus at 8 30 to go into seoul (laughs) because we i had to be at the sbs building at uh five o'clock in the morning on saturday oh man (laughs) <laughs> Hop on the bus at eight thirty, get into Seoul, probably about one. And then there was uh, grab a taxi and find a hotel near the the SBS. Got there at about two thirty, slept for a couple hours, got to the SBS, and just started filming uh, Saturday Sunday for SBS. And oh wow! And then the next and the crazy part about filming my Arirang show was supposed to premiere the week before. Mm-hmm. Um, however. 
Uh, Kim Jong Il died. I remember the day, that. The the day my my show was actually supposed to debut, so I got pushed. I got pushed because it was twenty four hour news coverage of Kim Jong Il's death. And I'm like, even when you're dead, you're making my life miserable. <laughs> Yeah, it was a joke, of course, but uh, yeah, so it was wild because Artie Dong debuted my episode the day I was filming, the first day of filming for the SBS show. Oh, wow. So I'm in the SBS show with some of my, my co-hosts, mm-hmm. and I'm watching my Artie Dong show on my phone on the SBS van as we're driving from location to location. <laughs> Big time celebrity. <laughs> oh, yeah. And yeah, so it was really wild. And then the SBS thing, uh, they wanted to film during the week too, but that couldn't happen because my owner wouldn't let me out of my classes to, to film, mm-hmm. despite that they would probably bring more publicity to the school but anyway again so then the next weekend was actually uh, christmas yep. so it was the first christmas that i didn't spend with family uh in one way or another because i was filming sbs oh wow uh, yeah so then the next week they needed to go down to the south Cholinando. Uh, oh wow that's down there the, the following week um but i had already had booked plane tickets to visit canada that week so i wasn't able to do that so i was only in i wasn't able to make it in for the entire the entire episode for that one but the funny thing is though too i found out later years later they had actually used some of the footage that i that had been cut originally for a different show that was actually on audio they didn't even tell me about that yes so that's how that that whole TV thing started, and uh, and this led to another big lesson too. Was the going had never been better, and it was just rolling and rolling and rolling. Things were just coming in, coming in, and it was just like, okay, you know, finally you made it, mm-hmm. you know. And then after the SBS, it 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 stopped. Oh, and you got left with, oh. Okay, well, how do I get it back? I loved it so much. <laughs> how do you do it again? How do you get back? After a while, I was like, you know what? Whatever. Yep. I'm just going to start taking photos for me again. Then just started doing that. Yeah, the the CNN mm-hmm. thing, that was a whole different kettle of fish. That was, yeah, that was a little after, after those because um, it was during uh, Kim... What's the kid's name now? Kim Jong Un. Yeah, Kim Jong Un. Yeah, yeah. Once he started taking power, he started rattling sabers a little more. And of course, the Western media makes it all to be a much bigger issue than it really is. And <laughs> yep, I uh, remember CNN saying, you know, we've never been closer to another Korean War and and everything else. And I'm looking around Samchuk, and I'm like, mm, no, people are just going about their lives here. Nothing's changed. Exactly. You know, it's at that time CNN had their eye reporter part too. So oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. You know, I'd post up a couple of pictures and I'd write a little blurb, you know, thinking, you know, this media gig's not so bad. It's kind of fun. I like it. So, you know, I'd do that. So then I got an email from CNN. They're like, we want to use, uh, we want to use your, your thing in, on the website. So I'm like, okay, go ahead. Then a little, a little after that, I got a phone or an email from them saying we want to do an interview. They did the interview. It, yeah, it was really strange because it was uh, on a on the computer. It was a black screen. <laughs> Not can't see who you're talking to, but uh, the voices were coming through. I can't remember her name, but she was one of the top one of the top uh, popular CNN international uh, anchors at the time, and that was really cool and. Uh, during the the filming too they they would actually they were showing some of my photos from around town that i'd taken oh amazing Uh, so that was that was pretty cool too so and that was pretty much the end of my tv career well can't say the end of the tv career because i did get a couple of offers after i moved back to pochan 
And I had a couple of others too. My wife, she doesn't like being photographed. She definitely doesn't want to be videotaped. But one of them they wanted to do where the foreign foreign husband, Korean wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah my wife said a big no for that one. And yeah. Uh, then I had another phone call about a year after that from another TV station. Uh, they were asking about my sunrise photos and uh, asking why, what was it about the sunrise photos that, that I liked so much I said to them, I said, well, you know, we're in Korea, you know, and outside of Japan and in Australia and New Zealand, we're essentially the first people in, in the world that get to see the, the sun first thing. And, you know, we're the first people in the world that get to see the sun every day. And I said to that's kind of cool. <laughs> They're like, well, we never thought of it that way. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but then, uh, you know, it, it was going on pretty smoothly. And then it was like, but I live in, in Pochan now. I don't live on the East coast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, so that was the end of, of that one where well, that one never, then it never ended up materializing. To be honest, though, like you, you touched on a good point, which I, I feel like we have sort of the 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 similar background, kind of like we're both rural kids from Canada, and I it, it must have been during that time, kind of like making your head spin a little bit, just because you know you went from Ontario to to yeah being in uh, uh, on the news on CNN, you're being in SBS like broadcasting centers like it it must have was a little bit of a trip for you like how how are you like finding that and then going back to like the average life of a english teacher in korea like were were you tempted to to like jump into full-time celebrity mode um there was a big piece of me that did um Mm -hmm. to be honest i'd always wanted to be on tv you know as a kid you go to those auditions you know for the commercials and whatnot and you wait around, and I remember doing a thing for Minute Rice, and <laughs> and uh, I didn't actually get the I didn't get the part, but it was it was really cool. But my parents at the time said, "No, that's the end of that. You're not doing that anymore." And uh, but yeah, no, it was it was pretty wild. But that piece of me, you know, I loved it. But at the same time, I loved teaching too. And you realize that you you really can't do both at that time. Yeah. Uh, because especially with hog ones, because they're not going to give you the time to to punt class for a day or two to go out and film a TV show. Yeah. Uh, you're there to teach the kids and make them money. And, you know, I understood that. I've always been able to understand the business side of things. And so I was like, you know what? I kind of like being just the everyday foreigner again, you know, mm-hmm. just knowing in the back of your head what you've been able to accomplish up to this point. And, uh, so yeah, it was there. You know, piece of me always wants to get back, of course. But yeah, it was uh, the peaceful life was was once again because you know a landscape photographer, Buddhist temples, and all that type of thing. You know, the peace and quiet. It's always been a good thing. For- you went from that uh, life, like the the average, you know, teacher in Korea, photographing on the weekends. That's sort of the same kind of thing that I was into. But then you. Uh, you know, for family reasons, you you moved back home and focusing mostly on, on sort of that transition. I know you're you're working probably more into the uh, photography realm now in Canada. How how was that tradition or transition? And like, what are sort of the main differences of like photography life in Korea versus Canada? Uh, well, I think the biggest thing for me is because I I did move back to Nova Scotia, so it's a place that I only visited once in my life when I was like eight years old. So I don't know the area very well and uh, oh. didn't know anybody. And, you know, and it's the, the strangest part, honestly, was um, as funny as it will, as it sounds is getting used to hearing and speaking English all the time. It, exactly. was, <laughs> it was such a strange feeling. And even to this day, when I go to work at, uh, some of the studios in New Brunswick, there's a large French population there. You know, New Brunswick's the only uh, bilingual, officially bilingual province in Canada. So yeah, the transition to to photography, yeah. So it was um, the way I approached my photography when I was in Samtuk. 
uh, I started mm-hmm. to do here too. Um, we had, we're on the Bay of Fundy side. And uh, so I'd wake up uh, and catch the sunrise over the Bay of Fundy. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> just start, you know, just keep doing what I was doing back in Korea. Yeah. <laughs> Photographer. You know, from that, that's basically all I, you know, that was my transition. Just keep doing what I was doing just in a different spot. You know, just try and, and do some stuff. And shout out to you, too. Your uh, lighthouse project is uh, was, oh. always a, <laughs> was always a big inspiration to me, too. And, uh, you know, Nova Scotia, you know, you're one of the things you think of are lighthouses in Nova Scotia. Peggy's so Cove, yeah. It was like... <laughs> I got to get some some really cool lighthouse shots too, and uh, you know, shooting oh, yeah, stars, it's a beautiful country out there, Milky Way, that type of stuff, and you know, I'd always had some thoughts on on what to do with that, and it's like, okay, you know, and like you said, Peggy's Cove, it was um, that was my first real big break, I suppose, after I got back. It's like I need to get the full moon behind Peggy's Cove. I think that I would be that a shot. great yeah. shot. It's not one you, you see very often because people just go during the day, they take their picture of it and go home, right? It's no, mm-hmm. not a lot of people take the time to, to plan their pictures of Peggy's Cove because it is such a touristy spot. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, so... Let's find the, you know, using my, my apps and that I use uh, for planning those type of shots, sunrises and, and whatnot. Uh, it's like, okay, here's the day that I need to go if I want to get the, the full moon. Weather's good. There's going to be no clouds in the sky. So in knowing the, where the lighthouse actually is and the surrounding features, on how where you need to stand to be able to get it i'm like well i'm not going to be able to get the full moon as it's rising at peggy's cove i can try uh but it's probably not going to work very well (laughs) uh but i did i did try um you know and that's the beautiful thing about the the full moon too is because it's rising as the sun's setting and you're getting those wonderful colors in the sky so I got down there for the sunset and the, the full moon rising. And yeah, it was pretty much what I thought. It wasn't great or by any means. And But the other part, it, the best part about that too, is that you get a, you actually get a second chance. You know, you don't get a second chances in South Korea, not South Korea, sorry, in, in photography. Mm. And, you know, just as the full moon's rising, as the sun's setting, the next morning, when the sun's rising, the full moon is setting. So you exactly. actually, you, you do get a second chance, and it's on the other side. So that's where you need to be. And so I uh, just essentially spent the night taking pic- trying to get pictures of hoping a shooting star might fly by or whatnot, and go mm-hmm. back to the car and have a little nap or whatnot. And then uh, just before the sun was start, supposed to come up, I got back out and found a spot. And it's like, okay, this is where I need to be for the, the full moon in behind the lighthouse and whatnot. And shoot no shots. And as I was, uh, a tall ship just started to to sail by, past the lighthouse. Oh, my at gosh. The same time. Oh, man, that's awesome. I said the only thing that would make that better would if it was the blue nose, right? Canada's most famous <laughs> yeah. ship, yeah. right? So I went to Lindenberg. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so the shots turned out great. Great color. The boat was just, it was the icing on, on the cake. And, uh, you know, that's, again, you know, you make your own luck, right? I had no idea the boat was going to go by, but I I was there and, and whatnot, and, and uh, so I put it up on on my social media, Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and uh, then I get a, a message from the Minister of Defense, 
the Canadian Ministry of Defense. I'm like, uh oh, what's this? Well, why am I getting an email from the Ministry of Defense? And they're like, <laughs> uh, that picture of of the ship in with Peggy's Cove. Uh, that was the HCMS Oreo. Uh, are would we be able to use that photo on our social media? Like, yeah, sure. Anything for you know, anything for the the Ministry of Defense. You know, go ahead. And uh, you, you don't want to piss off those guys. <laughs> no, exactly. Anybody with a gun, it's like, yeah, okay, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, um, take the camera too. <laughs> so, one of my friends who who is in the Canadian military too, he sent me a message asking if, if he could uh, buy a print of it. And mm-hmm. so I'm like, yeah, sure. And he said, you know that. Uh, the only thing he said to me too, he said the only thing that would make that photo more Canadian is if it was the blue nose. And I said, you know what? I was thinking the exact same thing when I shot it. <laughs> and then it was yeah, about exactly. ten minutes later, I got the message. I got the message from the the captain or the admiral of of the HCMS Oreo asking to use the photo. Sent him the the message back, and I said that. You know, apparently that was the Oreo. And he's like, wow, that's like the second best. That's the second best, you know, like the next one after the Blue Nose. That, the Oreo is like the next most famous boat in Canada. And I'm like, oh, okay, I never knew of it. But <laughs> but they were selling. <clears throat> the reason they pulled in was that they were going in to celebrate their 100-year anniversary of the, of the ship. You know, apparently this is a huge... And they still use this boat for for naval training. Um, but it, yeah, this was Canada's biggest navy boat for like years before they retired it out of you know. Serve, it's obviously not going to stand up to an aircraft carrier these days. But <laughs> so yeah, that's that's how that that happened. And I had you know a lot of the the crew members of the boat that were on the boat that day, including the 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 admiral all bought prints from it and you know and it Amazing. was uh, oh yeah so that was that was really cool so it was you know it's like okay here we go <laughs> and uh, and deal but then it's like you know what I need to in Canada it feels a little different um, yeah. you know that for us in Korea it, travel tourism landscapes you know that was the the bread and butter and um but in canada to me anyway in this area it felt if i was going to make any money in photography i'd have to jump into families and portraits and you know like the the dylan goldby style yeah business uh aspect so that's you know, again, you know, more learning. And uh, so I just happened to be into uh, nearby Walmart where they have the portrait studios here. And there was a sign said now hiring. And I'm like, why not? Let's throw in a resume, (laughs) you know? So uh, I put in a resume and uh, online and uh, on on the on the thing you know the the question is can we uh contact previous employers yeah and so i actually checked no for that because all my previous employers were korean and i figured nobody would be able to speak enough korean to be able to to talk to them let alone make the long distance call to korea to see if i check out so I went in that afternoon after I put it up on online. I I said, look, I I explained. I said, look, I, I checked no. I explained why. I said, is this going to be a big deal? And they're like, oh no, it's okay. And I'm like, okay, cool. So mm-hmm. I went back into the store to to catch up with my wife. My phone rang like literally three minutes later, saying, are you still in the store? And I yeah. said, yeah. Can you? for an interview i'm like yeah sure why not so i sat down and, uh, 
and did the interview and she's like, okay, you're hired. When can oh, you wow. start? Am I okay? I'll start tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> there so, you go. Yeah. And so that's what I'm, that's where I'm at now. Uh, I've actually taken over as manager of that studio. And wow. uh, I'm now, uh, because I moved, I'm now actually working out of another studio and managing that one as well as the one here, but 300 kilometers away. All right. Well, it sounds like you've had a kind of a, a great transition into your life in Canada. And I, I'm sure there's some ups and downs, but uh, as we get to the tail end of this podcast, uh, if you're working on anything right now, just let me know and uh, you can give a shout out to uh, whoever or whatever you're doing. Well, uh, from personal projects, uh, it's still the, the same, you know, like I've, um, you got to stay with the roots. So, uh, you know, it's travel and tourism, uh, trying to get on board with uh, Parks Canada, uh, the national park system. I, I would love to do a calendar with them for some of their parks. They've actually approached me first to about some of my photos of uh, the Grand Pre area that I have. And uh, so I'm trying to get that uh, wrapped around. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to be honest, managing these studios and, and working uh, essentially full time at uh, these portrait studios, um, it, it's eating up a lot of uh, personal time. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> For my own projects. And uh, although I have been shooting weddings and, and that type of thing, and like I mentioned earlier in, in the podcast, it, uh, that seems, you know, I think if you want to earn a living as a photographer in Canada, you do. It's it's it has to be from where I stand anyway. It's got to it. It's going to be one of the the main sources of, of income. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity out there for product photography too, uh, which I've dabbled in. Uh, still do a little bit of that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think in today's world, you, you know, it was always when, when we were learning photography was always focus on one area of photography get really good at it and i that's definitely a it's still definitely the way to go the the big guys that are earning the hundreds of thousands of dollars a day they're doing it shooting one genre mm -hmm. um but i think as everyday joe like myself you know if you're going to want to make a living as a photographer you do have to you know a little bit of this a little bit of that a little bit of that right i did i did some real estate photography for for a client as well i was shooting for a magazine here a local magazine here in in town as a, a as a fundraiser that they do every year um, so, you know, it's just little, little bits here and there doing that, uh, the studio work, of course, so they have me, you know, I'm willing to travel. So I usually help out. I'm actually, I've worked in all five of our Atlantic Canada studios. Now the two New Brunswick and the three, uh, Nova Scotian ones and the, the New Brunswick one, you know, it's always fun because there are a lot of French people in New Brunswick. Of course. And, yeah. And so I, you know. Having, like I said earlier, spending some time in France, I do have a fairly wide range of, of French knowledge. Um, not fluent by any means, a you know, stretch of the imagination, uh, but enough to get by, especially even in a working condition. <laughs> but the funny thing is, every time I hear French, I'm still automatically responding in Korean because it's, <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, when I don't hear English, I would, I would speak. I would speak Korean just as a natural reaction and kind of the same way when I got back after my term in France. If I didn't hear English, I would all I'd automatically respond in French. And but now it's trying to get that back. And, but, you know, the funny thing is, too, in the studio, I've had a lot of Korean customers come into the studio. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, to be able to speak Korean is is both, you know, two clients in particular, it helped quite a bit because their English wasn't very good. So for me to be able to, to respond and to help them out in Korean was, it was something else. And uh, all the others that did speak English were quite amazed. And, you know, right. I love seeing the look on their face when I start speaking Korean to them. They're like, <laughs> yeah. How do you know Korean? Well, yeah, I used to live there. And, you know, and as they're waiting for their, their for me to, do what I do on in Photoshop for, for their pictures. And 
throw out my laptop and I'd put it on YouTube and actually show them excerpts of the, the SBS documentary just so they get a little piece of their home life. <laughs> yeah, you're you're the celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> All so, right. Well that's well that that's actually a good kind of way to sort of bring everything back around again. Uh Lee, I really appreciate you you coming on here. We we've, we've had some tef- technical difficulties, but it's uh, you know yeah. it it's par for the course, I guess, here. But uh thank you so much for coming on and hopefully at some point our paths will cross somewhere either I here hope so. or or in the Atlantic Canada, maybe we'll yeah. take a trip out there sometime. So thank you again. Ooh, thank you for having me. It's been awesome. It's great to see and talk to you again, of course. And Perfect. Great time. <laughs>